Hey everybody, welcome to the show today. We are brought to you as always by Black Rifle Coffee. You can go to the Coffee Club and you can get 25% off the first month and also many other items on the uh, site by clicking the link in the description and using the code BLASTOFF25. That is our code and you will get some fantastic coffee. Today, we're going to be talking science. If you are a fan of Saltwater Experience and you watched our latest season, the 2023 season, we fished with a bonefish scientist, Nick, Captain Nick Castillo. He is a, a very good fisherman in his own right, and he's also a very knowledgeable scientist. He's doing a lot of work with the pharmaceutical studies that you may have uh, heard about. They're finding pharmaceuticals in bonefish. What does that mean? That's what we're going to talk about today with with Nick and uh, what can we do about it? What what does it signal as far as what's going on and why are the fish being exposed to these drugs that we take? And they're going through us, getting into the water and getting into the bonefish. What does that mean for the population? What does that mean for the fish? What does that mean for us as anglers? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Stick around. Here comes Nick. All right, I'm Captain Nick Castillo. This is the Tom Rowland podcast, and today we're going to talk some bonefish science, some fishing, and have a good time. All right, Nick, how are you, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, Tom. Good to see you. Yeah, and we hadn't seen you since uh, since we shot the show together. It was fun. Yeah. Oh, that was a good time. We had some tough fishing, but we made a good good day out of it. We sure did, and we got some good science. So um, you are working with FIU, is that correct? Yeah, I'm a PhD candidate at FIU. I'm with uh, Dr. Jennifer Rehage in the Coastal Fisheries Lab. I know you know her yeah, pretty well. One of our favorite guests, show. man. She's uh, she's been on the show a number of times and um, given us some incredible um, information on all the stuff that they do there. And now you're uh, 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 you're going to be taking over and doing all kinds of stuff there as well. So yep. looking forward to it. Um, so in order for the audience to get to know you a little bit. If you, if you haven't seen Nick on Saltwater Experience, the, the episode that we did, it was a, it was a 2023 episode. So one of our brand new, brand new shows just dropped on uh, YouTube and it was on Discovery Channel just recently in Waypoint. Uh, but if you haven't seen him there, we're going to do a one minute hot seat. All right. So Nick, the, the, the whole idea here is we're going to try to get through as many of these questions as possible. Maybe you can set a record. I think about 13 or 14 is the number that people have gotten through. So you don't want to put a lot of thought into it. You just want to go with, uh, you know, whatever, whatever comes to mind and, uh, or you can say pass, you can say pass, I guess. All right. Nobody's, nobody's really passed, but you could. All right. So you ready to go? 20, uh, we got, got the hot seat questions. Ready? All right. We'll start the clock right now. Inshore or offshore? Inshore. Rock, country, or other? Rock. Mountains or beaches? Beaches. One thing you're afraid of? Spiders. <laughs> Fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. Audio book, Kindle, or paper? Paper. The last book you remember reading? Mm, it was uh, A Land Remembered. The Office, Friends, or Parks and Rec? Office. Three non-negotiables in your life? Fishing, a boat, and a movie. The best advice you ever remember being given? It just takes one good shot. Nice. Uh, Technological gadget or invention that you rely on the most in your life? Fortunately, a laptop. Okay. Something you're proud of? Mm, This uh, work I work on, the bonefish science. If you could have one superpower... What would it be, even though we're over? Flying. I have to go with that. It might be cliche, but let's do it. (laughs) All right. That sounds great. We made it to 11. You made, uh, or actually maybe 12. Maybe 12. So that's close close to the record. That's pretty good. So you're, you, uh, you're not afraid of sharks, but you are afraid of spiders. That probably leads you to doing all of your research in the ocean rather than (laughs) someplace where spiders live. Although yeah, I've, I've it. encountered some bad looking spiders in my boat occasionally with it, <laughs> if it sits, you know? Um, yeah. so anyway, so, uh, Nick, tell me how you, uh, how you started. You, you told us on saltwater experience, but I'd like for this audience to, to know kind of what your path was to, uh, to studying what you're studying and how you end up 
having what I would think is like the ultimate uh, job for someone who uh, is a is a researcher and likes to fish. I mean, you are not. I mean, you're a great fisherman, and you uh, get to go out there and catch bonefish and tag them and do all these cool things and learn about them. And uh, it just seems like the perfect the perfect uh, job. And I don't think that anybody can just do that. Like it, it seems like that's a there. There are only a few of those positions, and you got one, so that's pretty cool. How did yeah, that happen? Yeah, super cool. Well, you're right. I mean, they are far and few between, but they're there. And I think that they present themselves to somebody who's passionate about that work because the the work we do you really need to be passionate about it. Cause I mean, yeah, we get to be on the water, but there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that are maybe not as enjoyable behind the computer. You know, I said, my computer is the piece of technology, unfortunately I'm behind, but as far as how I got here. Uh, so I grew up in Fort Myers, Florida, and for whatever reason, I was always obsessed with fishing. And as we mentioned on the show, I was watching you guys back in the day, laying on the carpet, you know, Sundays, probably sun sports at the time. Um, but yeah, just enamored by fish. And I was a really hyperactive kid. So my parents would uh, make it such that I'd try in school by bribing fishing ability to go out this summer. You can fish or you can't straight A's, please. Um, but I didn't, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I was passionate about fishing. So uh, I went to college, I did my undergrad at Duke and just studied environmental science, but only after a late night 3 a.m. exam experience when I was a junior. I was studying neuroscience at the time and I was with a friend. I'm like, I'm not passionate about this. You know, I like the environment. You know, I don't know what the career path was, which is probably what kept me from doing it at first. It's it's not clear cut. You know, you study neuroscience, you study economics, you'd be a doctor, you work with finance or something. So it didn't make sense, but I was like, all right, I'm going to go for it. Um, graduated and then came down to Big Pine Key and taught at Sea Camp there. Oh, nice. And I'm sure a lot of, you know, your listeners maybe have kids that go there. It's a really cool place. Yeah. So I taught there for a year, um, but I'd, I'd been fishing in the Keys my whole life. So from Fort Myers, quick trip. And I really uh, knew well one guy down there, Captain Mark Johnson. So I fished with him a bit. And the funny way I got to know him was um, that story we mentioned on the show <laughs> where I went on the computer when I was like 10. My parents said, straight A's, fishing trip. And mind you, I'm in Fort Myers. So they're like, we'll just go down the road. But I hopped on the computer and I booked a trip with Rich, came out like, all right, let's go to the Keys. My parents were like, what? But we went down and unfortunately Rich was sick. So he called that night before and set us up with Mark. And I just stayed in touch with Mark. He helped facilitate my um, enjoyment of the fishing down there. And next thing I know, I was in the position to start guiding. So after I finished sea camp in 2015, 2016, I started guiding out of Isla Mirada. So mostly running bay boats, but still um, skiff fishing. And then Irma came through and I found myself with a mold remediation crew tearing stuff out. And I was like, you know what, let me uh, apply to grad school. Hmm. So <laughs> I applied to grad school and it was, this is the part of, um, I think everyone's journey where sometimes luck comes into play. It's just timing of things. You know, you can take advantage with these lucky opportunities by working hard and, and all that and setting yourself up. But the, um, PhD program I'm working on now with Bonefish Starp and Trust. They were looking for somebody that could study bonefish. And that's a unique fish to study, as you well know. You can't just go out there and I'm going to sample 10 today. You need to have a little bit of know-how. And I had that angling experience. So um, it really wasn't the direction I was planning on following. If you'd asked me a year prior, Nick, will you be doing this? Hmm. Uh, I wouldn't have had no clue. But it just worked out and it ended up being one of the best things I could have done because I'd had the opportunity to do really cool research that I feel like has real world implications. You know, it's not just going to be published and put on a shelf. I feel like all of our fisheries, not just the bonefish fishery, could in in one way or the other be benefited by the research that I'm doing and our lab in general, you know, with Jen and all the other work we do in the Everglades. So that's a little of a long, long story as to how I'm here chatting with you right now. But well, it's super cool. And, how... and I think that one of the things that might be interesting to talk about today is how, you know, what you're talking about, how the work that you're doing might benefit um, other fish and other anglers other than people that just like to like to bone fish. And and that's the real uh, pharmaceutical work that you've been doing. That, uh, and I'm sure that a lot of people that are listening know that you've you and and others have found pharmaceuticals in 
the fish and these bonefish can be like a like a, a harbinger or a bellwether kind of uh, canary in the coal mine uh, for like what's going on. So if we're finding them inshore in bonefish, maybe should we be looking for them somewhere else and how widespread is this? And maybe that could even lead back to how is this so much of the pharmaceuticals getting into the water? And maybe, I mean, you, you tell us what the, what, what could happen, you know, just by learning that they're there, what would be the next course of action to, to kind of fix that. But that's just kind of interesting. Tell us about how that um, program started and why someone would even look for pharmaceuticals in, in fish. Um, I found that yeah. to be really interesting when we were fishing together. Yeah, well, you know, pharmaceuticals, they're a relatively new compound, you know, um, our pharmaceutical industry has increased like dramatically since the 1970s. And I'll actually I'll pull up a very quick little um, thing for you there. So let me just share something. So this is in a nutshell, why we are studying pharmaceuticals now. So this figure is showing like the proportional change of things that we care about with the environment. So you've got CO2, human population, and then that orange line is the increase in drugs that we've been making. Wow. So it's we've dramatically increased how many drugs we're producing. So it's happened so quickly that we didn't have the ability to understand what was really happening outside of us taking those drugs. So like so, what was happening so elsewhere. So just to be clear, it starts at 1955 and goes to 2015 and it seems like uh right there where you're pointing that should be mm. what like 1980s or something and then probably just about the 80s, yeah. But then where where is that like it goes up pretty substantially right where your yeah. mouse is to right there. Where is at, at the bottom of that trajectory? Where is that? Is that 1995? Is what? looks like it's just about 95. I, I couldn't say exactly what sort of incident happened there to just dramatically increase the um, pharmaceutical uh, production. But it's just we've since then, just year after year, it's like exponential the amount that we're producing. So just in general, in the United States, we have about six billion different prescriptions that are dispensed every single year. That's a ton. Wow. So I'll pop out of there and I'll go back to our faces. Yeah. See here. So it's a ton. We're, we're taking all these drugs. And so it's like inevitably it's making its way into the environment. And you asked me um, just a moment ago, well, if it's in bonefish, what about elsewhere? Like what about offshore? Um, people have found pharmaceuticals at concentrations that could disrupt ecosystems in the Antarctic. So they found that they're in phytoplankton, so like the basis of the food web there, and at concentrations that could change the um, composition of that food web. So it could have a ripple effect. So we're finding them anywhere. So I haven't tested, let's say, a dolphin or a tuna, but odds are it's there. We can find it in open ocean water. And it really, you can trace it back to us us taking these drugs and um, improper treatment of them because uh, as we mentioned with that figure you know we've been producing them so quickly and uh, there was that one it started remember the line in 1975 yeah you know our wastewater infrastructure let's say in Miami was built then so well before we had all these new contaminants that would be in the water so it's not so much that we were ignoring an issue we didn't know it was something to consider when we made all of our wastewater treatment plants and now we're taking so many pharmaceuticals there's other chemicals that that just can't be removed with the way they work now so they're making their way into the water so on these pharmaceuticals and some of the other chemicals that you're referring to can those be removed like in your own drinking water, like with these, you know, like a like a Berkey filter or some type of other filter? Do, do I mean, I, I read about that, that some filters, they claim that they can remove things yeah. like pharmaceuticals. But I, I don't know. Do you, are, is it possible to remove them out of the water or is it so, are they so in such? I don't know. Is it difficult? It seems like it must well, be difficult they're, because they're not getting it out of the wastewater. It's definitely difficult. Like, well, the the wastewater treatment was really designed for like biosolid waste. So, mm -hmm. you know, bacteria, viruses, things that directly would hurt us. So it's like that bio um, active kind of removal. And these compounds don't fall in that category. So they weren't targeted. 
Um, as far as like your own drinking water, there's a few things that can help a little bit. So some of the things that like wastewater treatments would use would be um, like charcoal or activated coal filters. So those can remove some of the pharmaceuticals. Um, UV, if you were to treat your water with UV, that can remove some of those. Um, I One of the other chemicals we were talking, well, I was referencing at least was um, PFAS, which they're used in... Um, anti-stick coatings for pans, they're in flame retardants, and they're finding now that those are essentially like forever chemicals. And we're finding out now that they're really dangerous, or they can be dangerous at really low concentrations. And uh, a scientist I was chatting with about that said that the best thing you could do would be a reverse osmosis system with your drinking water. Mm. Um, but it's just tough. These These chemicals are everywhere. So we're drinking water, sure. Um, produce, uh, seafood, if you're eating seafood, there's just so many different routes of exposure that um, it's really hard to avoid, unfortunately. Yeah. So that's, that's us. And then mm -hmm. let's talk about the fish, like as it, as it applies to the fish, we're finding them in bone fish. And so what's the, what's the concern? Um, I, I mean, obviously it's strange that you would find them in there. And obviously if it, if it uh, changes our behavior, at some concentration would possibly change a fish behavior too is that is that what you're finding or what what is the concern that we have by when we find pharmaceuticals in in fish yeah so i mean pharmaceuticals as a compound itself they're designed to do something at a really low dose because we don't want to be taking like bucket loads of a pill for something to happen so they're really active at low concentrations and those are concentrations that we find out in the environment for some of these drugs um and they're they're not toxic right so the the amount there it's not going to kill a fish it's not like some sort of toxic compound where you see dead fish floating everywhere but what is changing uh are important behaviors for survival and then there's also let's say feminization feminization of some fish so if they're exposed to birth control for example in the water which is really active at a low concentration it can change um physiological things that are really necessary for like successful reproduction so it's really changing behavior it's not killing the fish but these are really important behaviors for surviving so like evading a predator um, when we think of fish that have an issue evading sharks or other fish so those are the things that we're concerned about is this change in behavior that could lead to that entire population having difficulty surviving wow. and unlike you and i like i take tylenol or something six seven hours later it's out of my system but the problem with these fish in the water is that they're just continuously breathing in water that has that chemical so it's a constant dose so even though it's metabolized it's not like mercury that stays there forever they're just constantly getting a dose hmm. and it's multiple drugs right if you were to go to the doctor your doctor's like okay i'm thinking about this one medication what else are you taking because they're worried about what they do to each other and these fish um, some of the ones that we've tested some of the bone fish had 17 different drugs so that's 17 different drugs that it could all be doing something they could be doing the same thing on the same receptor and just really having a pretty profound effect and the concentrations we're finding are high enough to do something so some of them are above what we call the therapeutic concentration so you need a concentration in your body for that drug to do something so once it hits that or it's above that whatever it's designed to do can happen and we're finding those concentrations in the fish that we're testing in the wild wow wow and so when you find these another thing that we were talking about when we were fishing was you know, finding uh, concentrations, you know, higher concentrations in certain areas or others might might um, indicate that that there was additional exposure, maybe a leak some, somewhere to explain how that works and how you use that information for, yeah. for for that type of thing. So we're working on a paper right now that we just started working on, um, and that's focusing on Tylenol. So Tylenol is one of the drugs that's actually really well removed, almost 100% through wastewater treatment. So some of the drugs pass through untreated. Sometimes they're even in higher concentrations than when they went into the wastewater. But Tylenol is really well removed, and it doesn't last long in the environment. So if we find it, we can say that that was a recent release of untreated water, or it was a septic system release, because septic systems won't treat it. 
So we are finding it in certain areas. So we find it in Biscayne Bay and a, a little bit in the upper keys, like maybe one or two fish out of 20. And in the lower keys, completely absent in Key West, but uh, really prevalent in the fish from the dry tortugas, which is super surprising, right? Really? Um, yeah, yeah. So basically every step of the way in this study, I've been just surprised. Nothing has been like, you know, we hypothesize things as a scientist and pretty much all of those were wrong, right? right. So I, I looked at Biscayne Bay and I was excited to include the dry tortugas thinking like, okay, we're going to have a comparison, but it just kind of showing us that this is a water quality issue that certain remote areas that aren't urban just unfortunately aren't spared of this issue right so so let's talk about that for a second completely absent in key west so in mm -hmm. this so in the context of what we're talking about the tylenol being completely absent around key west means that um maybe their sewage system their wastewater treatment is solid no leaks um it's doing what it's supposed to do but then when you find it out in the dry tortugas you know, lots of tourists go out. I mean, it's a, it's an island 70 miles off of Key West, but lots of tourists go out there every single day on float planes and boats and everything else. People have to pee. They, yep. they got to go. And maybe that's an antiquated uh, wastewater uh, treatment out there or none at all um, because it's probably not even set up. I mean, it, it's really not set up for a lot of people to be there. There were soldiers there, you know, for a while. And uh, Dr. Mudd, was there. There's a little bit of trivia and history for you. That's the, uh, isn't that the one that, wasn't it Dr. Mudd that was, was, uh, in the, in the dry tortugas after, um, he, tr he, uh, um, and man, I could be totally butchering this on this I'm not, giant I'm not certain, audience, but, but, you're on the track. <laughs> but it's the doctor that, um, that treated John Wilkes Booth, I think after That's he shot right. Lincoln. Yeah. And then yeah. they, they said, well, we got a special place for you. And they send yeah. him out to the to the dry tortugas is where he's going to serve his time for aiding right. aiding a, yeah. a, a a criminal that that shot the president, and so. Uh, but anyway, um, at at that point, they probably didn't have much in in the way of sewage treatment. Um, and maybe it just went straight into the water, and it probably didn't hurt anything. You got seventy soldiers out there no big deal there's nobody else out there no no one around the ocean can easily handle that but when you have uh 700 tourists going out there every single day maybe that's a bigger problem yeah. a big difference and certainly we didn't have these drugs a long time ago back then um but now is that is that kind of the conclusion to draw that 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 septic system or that system needs some some work because you're finding the tylenol in the water I think it's telling us that, um, well, so you mentioned, let's say 700 people. That doesn't sound like a lot, but if you've been to the dry tortugas, you know that it's a tiny little spot, like, I don't know, one square kilometer or two. Yeah. So it's a tiny little point. So 700 people, as you said, peeing in the water, taking their boats out, maybe they're unfortunately disposing of their, their waste too close. So it's kind of telling us that um, when you compare 700 people to Biscayne Bay with a few million people in Miami that a few people in a very concentrated area can still have a big effect on that ecosystem. So it's kind of being conscious of that, that even though we think this is super remote, that we can still have an impact on that, that ecosystem there. So yeah, I think you're, you were spot on saying that it's just that it's a small area. We have some people that are likely not disposing of their waste to just peeing in the waters up there. And as far as dry tortugas is concerned, as a visitor, you're supposed to use uh, a porta potty, and then that waste is shipped out. It's like a dry porta potty with like sawdust and everything. So it, it's likely a, a, a point source of exposure, and probably from tourists. And just it's not not by any fault of the dry tortugas or anything. It's just now we're recognizing that a few people can have a big impact. Don't forget though that the cruise ships go th yeah. th through there too, and they could be. You know, who knows what yeah, they do. Yeah, there, there's studies that are showing that open ocean areas that are near shipping channels can have higher concentrations or presence of pharmaceuticals and contaminants. So if you're near a shipping area, um, like a cruise ship, which I'm sure the dry tortugas gets passed by a lot from ships going to Key West, that could be a source, open mm. ocean source. 
So tell us how you, uh, what's the process of, of uh, determining, you know, the screening process for a fish, whether it's a bonefish or any other kind of fish. What, what, how do you determine that, that, that there are pharmaceuticals in, in that fish? Yeah. So you can test, um, it has to be a tissue. So you could test muscle. Um, if you were to be killing the fish, you could test like internal tissues, liver, brain. But what we use primarily is blood. So we can take a blood sample and then release the fish on their way. And then the, the blood's a really good medium to be able to detect a bunch of different drugs because regardless of it being an anti-anxiety drug that goes to your brain or a drug that's distributed throughout the body, one way or the other, it's in the blood. So we take uh, a blood sample, we need to keep it free from sunlight and we freeze it preferably on dry ice and keep it super cold. And then we have to use a mass spectrometer to analyze that sample. So we put the sample on, into the mass spectrometer. It looks at the weight of every, let's say molecule, right? So it has a comparison and there's a curve. And then we can say, okay, this curve matches this drug. It matches that contaminant. We can get an ID for that drug and a concentration of what it was. Hmm. And it's pretty cool. We're able to look at 102 different drugs in one sample and it's uh, 0.2 milliliters. So like a super small amount of a sample. We can learn a lot from that. Wow. And so when we, uh, when we were fishing, <clears throat> you had quite the kit. Uh, mm -hmm. You had a pelican box that was that was ready to go. Uh, we had a, you know, the uh, I don't know what you call that. It was like an infant. Uh, yeah. It, what what is that? I mean, it, basically, it it's was just, it was a it was a net, a pool floaty we but it was a pool up, floaty. Yeah, I, I made a fancy sling out of PVC. I went to Home Depot and got all this stuff, and then Ross, Doctor Ross Busek, who works for Bonefish Tarpon Trust, showed up one day with this pool floaty he picked up at Publix, and bam, that worked perfectly yeah so that, that was cool perfect play. it really yeah. was perfect because the way this worked is you can watch the show or you, i'm sure that a lot of people have seen this on on the social media it's been around uh there's this blue thing and it looks like maybe it was even made for this purpose but you catch a bonefish and you don't even have to touch the bonefish you just slide the bonefish you know take the line and just put it you know just there's an inflatable ring around this and some some mesh inside that happens to be blue which is perfect color for it. And the fish just sits in there in literally about, it couldn't be three inches of water, maybe th three or four inches of water. It's perfect. Absolutely yeah, perfect. It, yeah. And, and the fish just chilled out. Like, like I'm a, like if, when you put bait in a well that is blue, you can, there's a noticeable difference. It seems like, um, from one that is square and white, like they're running into the into the corners, and the bait is is kind of freaking out. But some of the live wells are, are rounded. There's no there are no uh, no corners for it to run into, and so they just chill out. And they're and I think the blue people say that blue makes a big difference. But when I saw it on your your deal, that that pool floaty, um, it, that fish did really really chill out. And then the depth of it was perfect for you to be able to do your work. And then you had another, you had, a, you brought a machine, uh, with us. So explain how, um, what, what that process was for somebody that might've seen the show. And, uh, you know, it's a 22 minute and 30 second show. So we did a lot of talking on the boat that didn't actually make it into the show about exactly what you were doing there. But I think it's interesting to know what goes into, uh, sampling the blood and, and just what you're doing and how much, um, we can learn from that one sample of, of blood that we take from a bonefish. Yeah. So that, that machine is a centrifuge. So what we take the blood sample, it's red, and it has the blood se blood cells in the plasma, which is the liquid that the blood cells are in. And so we have to centrifuge it, so spin it really, really quickly with an anticoagulant that keeps that blood from cl clotting. And after spinning it, we'll have all the red blood cells on the top, a little layer of that anticoagulant um, gel, and uh, oh, vice versa. So blood here, gel, and then all of that clear liquid. So once that's all said and done, it's just really clear, maybe a little creamy colored liquid. And that's what has the pharmaceuticals that we're looking for. So we get the, we can test the pharmaceuticals in that, but um, as we're expanding this study, so, you know, we figured out, yes, there are drugs in fish, it's everywhere and it's a meaningful concentration. Now it's kind of a question as to, well, what is that doing? So we can also use that blood to look at other indices of health. So we could look at 
indices of reproductive health in fish, just regular fitness. Is that is that a healthy fish? Does it have certain levels of stress? And we can look at the levels of these pharmaceuticals, the contaminants and these health metrics and try to get a better idea of what's happening to the fish. Because we know from the lab that there can be these health effects and differences in growth rates or body size and then all these behavioral changes. But we don't know that that's happening definitively because we just haven't tested for it. I mean, we have all of the evidence that it has the capability of happening. So really, that's like the next step is is the movement changing. Can we do a telemetry study? Um, what's happening to the health? So a little bit more information from the blood. It, it's pretty crazy how, how crafty scientists are with taking a scale or a fin clip and telling you this is what it eats and this is what supports it, it, in the food web. This is what's in the fish. So yeah, we you could we do that from a scale, lot. just a single scale. You could tell what a fish has been eating. So we do it most often with a fin clip. So mm -hmm. we took a fin clip on the show. Yeah, not a not a big piece. So like you know, in the in the fin, there's those rays, um, and we could take like a clip, go down two of those rays, and just that little fin clip. What we'll do is you dry it out and you look at stable isotopes. So you look at nitrogen and carbon most often, and there's a ratio of that that is in everything. So you could look at the ratio of the carbon and nitrogen and say that that is like a fingerprint of seagrass or mm. the epiphytes, or it's a fingerprint of it eating pinfish. So then you can look at that and kind of trace the pathway in the food web to see what's the most important energy source. Wow. So in Florida Bay, we can sample, and we're, our lab's doing a lot of this work, um, sampled everything. So seagrass, the epiphytes, all that brown stuff living on the seagrass, everything at the bottom of the food web all the way up to the top and look at that and say what's the most important resource for supporting this and does that important resource change in the winter and the summer and it does um, is that important resource uh, changing with different environmental um, changes so water quality is it changing the availability of the most important resource so we can learn all that from a thin clip so uh, you're obviously talking to a whole bunch of fishermen right now. So yeah. the, uh, everybody's like uh, on the edge of their seat. Okay, well, then what is the most important thing that a bonefish eats or a permit eats or a tarpon eats? What do you have an answer for that? Like, what is the most like, you know, like if you sampled 100 fish, would there be uh, something that is the that is the primary food source for that fish and a secondary food source and a third food source well, or? As as a as an angler yourself, what do you think? I I want to see. I think that it probably thought. changes over over the year, and I think that it probably changes even flat to flat, probably. But Absolutely, I think that yeah. there are. I think that um, there would probably be uh, three or four things that whether whether they're number one, number two, and number three in this fish, or number three, number two, and number one in this fish, they're going to be present in the top few things that they're eating. But I do think that, I mean, I've seen behavior out of fish on certain flats that I don't see anywhere else. They're, they're chasing yeah. bait or they're, cha you know, like bonefish doing things that are different than other ones. And maybe it's like, okay, I don't know, maybe they're eating snails out of the grass. They're doing something different um, and they don't act like this other places. So I don't know. I mean, that's just an observation, but that's, that's bro science at its best yeah. uh, saying, well, I think they're chasing. I think they're eating some sort of fish in here because they're they're scooting around and and over here they're tailing very very slowly. Everywhere they're moving and they're tailing very very slowly. They're obviously not eating whatever they are on that other flat because they act different. Um, so I don't know. Tell tell no, us what you think. Spot on with that. So we've done a couple studies. Uh, one you, you mentioned Mike Larkin. So I'm going to chat about his study. So he did a ton of work with the bonefish in Florida. So really everything that started what we know Mike did over the course of his PhD. And uh, he looked at Isla Mirada, so Florida Keys and Biscayne Bay. And the diet is different from bonefish on the ocean side versus on the bay side. And that makes sense based on what you were saying, like, okay, this fish here is feeding. So maybe they mud more on softer bottom because right. they're rooting around for something else. Um, and we, this is another interesting thing about what we can do with just a little sample. So we 
in most of the fish that I sampled, we take a little swab, and I bet you were really familiar with this now after COVID, the little swab that goes up your nose or in your cheek if you did a DNA test. We take the same thing, and we put it in the fish cloaca, which is his butt, and just take a little sample, and then run that through a DNA analyzing, so PCR, and we can look at what it was eating. So we can estimate the diet that way. And we just recently published a paper on that with bonefish. Hmm. And so can people read that? Where, where yeah, would they yeah, read it? Yeah, we can um we can go ahead and anything that we're referencing here provide a link, okay. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, so that'll be in the show notes. Um yeah. and I'm sure that l- lots of people would love to read that. So for the anglers listening here that are bone fishing, what are they eating? Um, I don't know if we're tying flies for a lot of the things that they're eating. We're not tying. So a lot of what they eat are mollusks, snails. Um, we I have analyzed a few of the gut contents of some bonefish. And in Biscayne Bay, there was one bonefish that had its stomach completely stuffed with tiny, tiny, tiny black snails, huh. just completely full. So, I mean, we're not throwing a tiny black snail. But uh, I know of people that are some pioneer fly fishermen that have their worm flies, and that's top of the diet. So annelids, worms. Listen, man, that's that, number I'm one I'm sure you've me. seen those little squiggly. I think it's like Flip Palette uses that I've, a lot. I've, squiggly got, worm. I've got one. I, it's called the green worm, and it's yep. the simplest fly in the world, and I've taken it all over. I took it to Christmas Island, and the guy totally laughed at me. He was like, no, man, we're not throwing that. So when he wasn't looking, I tied it on there, and this fish just piled on it he's like let me see the fly and i pulled it out he's like oh you didn't do that you (laughs) didn't do that and and then he wouldn't let me take it off for the rest of the trip i mean they pile on a worm some places but i have also gone uh where was it i was in uh exuma and they didn't really like it that much they ate it but not like not like they do in other places well maybe they're just maybe it isn't the bottom to support the worms there just back to what you're saying flat to flat So worms are really important. Honestly, I feel like what we mimic when we're bone fishing is lower on the diet of what they find. They're not seeing those big shrimp that we use to catch our bone fish Mm -hmm. day in, day out. They're seeing smaller um, pistol shrimp, snapping shrimp, um, mantis shrimp. So annelids, shrimp, mollusks, that's the top of the diet. But they also really love um, toadfish. And I bet you part of like, let's say our bonefish quans or some other flies, we think that they're mostly mimicking like a crustacean, but I bet you like larger patterns. And let's say you put marabou or rabbit on there, but she looks like a toadfish. Sure. And they, they like to eat toadfish a lot as well. Yeah. Do you think tarpon eat toadfish a lot too? I bet they do, right? I, I mean, like there was that fly for anything. a long time. It was the toad fly, and yeah. it was kind of a merkin body, and it had either uh, marabou or kind of rabbit strip behind it. And then then we just took that same time, type of fly and made it smaller, and it was a great bonefish fly too. Um, and that made more sense that it was toadfish. I just didn't know maybe a, a tarpon such a such a uh, kind of an omnivore, kind of opportunistic yeah. feeder that if it looks pretty good, probably a pretty good chance that they might eat it or at least they would a long time ago i'd now, say they would now now yeah. now they are, are a little more closed mouth on the ocean anyway but <laughs> yeah. um uh the toad fish is, the, yeah. the toad fish is a really important thing and, and i would assume that you're finding uh that permit eat those as well yeah i haven't looked into that myself but i mean they're similar environment so i imagine the permit as well um I mean, bonefish and permit are really interesting. Have you ever taken a peek in back in their mouth of a bonefish oh, yeah. or a permit yeah, and see yeah. those pressures? Mm-hmm. That's that's also why I think that um, at least with well with fly we're doing a strip set right, but with um, uh, when you're throwing shrimp, you don't really want a strong hook set. At least in my experience, I feel like because of those crushers, if you were to set that hook immediately, you're kind of bouncing off of it. And then if it's a little bit less tension, I think then it finds purchase in the softer mouth of a bonefish. But those crushers are just crazy looking. So that's how they're eating these snails and these clams and these mollusks or sea urchins, right? Sea cucumbers, they're crushing all of it down. So they're, yeah, they're designed really interesting, both permit and bonefish creatures to eat a very specific type of prey similar to redfish too you know rooting around and eating all the crustaceans that's cool so a couple of things i'm curious um first of all have you ever fished with mike larkin i've not had the pleasure yet i've had a beer with him but have you yeah yeah yeah, a couple conferences what a nice guy i think it would be so awesome to get you guys together on a boat 
<clears throat> I think yeah, that would just great. be so much fun because Mike is a he's a great guy and he's um he's got so much knowledge. I mean, that guy has forgotten oh, yeah. more than uh than than he, he thinks he has. And and I think that just having both of you together and and doing all this research at two different time periods in history, I think would be very interesting just for me to, to pull you guys around and and just listen to you talk i think would be awesome uh well, and then I the second thing you both enjoy that yeah yeah well the second thing i was going to ask is that you mentioned that bonefish that was just absolutely stuffed full of those little um little little uh snails what it, are, are have there been a few other fish don't have to be bonefish or permit or tarpon but you've done a tremendous amount of uh of of sampling and and work have there been other fish that have surprised you with what is in their stomach? Mm, my work personally, I haven't done too much gut content with other fish, but um, so I'll speak to two. So one in my lab, we do a lot of snook research and uh, up in the Shark River in the headwaters in the Harney um, River up there. And they have and they rely heavily upon maybe not a surprise, but um sunfish and a lot of exotics since they're there mm -hmm. but also um peacock eel huh. so there's i don't, know, I don't know if you've ever seen that one i, I don't know what you would if you're if you're up there no but, i don't know what uh, that is necessarily it's if you were to call an eel cute it's it's one of those <laughs> it, it's cool it's the cutest it, little eel i've ever seen yeah it looks like it's got like a little elephant trunk um yeah if you're listening now and later look it up it's cute um, but they're they're in another invasive thing that's up in the Shark River now and up in the headwaters there. So when we do our research up there, we do electro fishing. So it shocks, it puts electrical current in the water and it'll stun everything for a moment. So we'll scoop it up at the net and they can do um, gastric lavage and get some of the stomach contents out. But yeah, we're finding a lot of eels up there. And then as far as like diet, so I haven't done a diet analysis study, but with lemon sharks, you know, you notice sometimes, let's say here in Florida, if you're seeing bonnet heads, maybe it doesn't necessarily mean there's a ton of bonefish up there, but sometimes like juvenile lemon sharks might be, okay, maybe there are. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so much that those small lemon sharks, because like some of these ones we're talking about, they aren't big enough to eat a bone, but their diet consists and overlaps a lot with the bonefish so they're up there feeding on the same things hmm. so the same like crustaceans those small juvenile hmm. lemon sharks so that that's one thing i you know i think is interesting with our conversation bonefish and lemon sharks when they're smaller have a really similar diet that's interesting and it must be the similar diet to redfish too because i was just telling you we were fishing in the everglades recently and there is a hatch of juvenile lemon sharks i mean there's a Ooh. hatch i mean they they can't be they're weeks old, days old. I wow. don't know. They're they're 18 inches long, and there wow. are zillions of them. It's crazy how many there are. 18 inches to you know three feet long, two feet long, like little little, yeah. little sharks. They're not gonna, they're not going to eat your fish, but there are so many. And as you're if you're red fishing, you know they can look a lot like a redfish. Like if they're if their fins stay down, they throw a little weight, kind of similar to a to a redfish. And you know if, when they start wagging their tail, you can tell the difference yeah. between them. But um, they even have kind of a similar color when they're really when they're really little. So we were paying very close attention to everything that we're seeing and looking. Uh, shark, 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 yeah. shark, shark. Uh, that one that one looks good. That's a redfish, and uh, just so many of those things. Uh, yeah. and I guess they hatch this time of the year. Is that is that when a lemon shark? I'm not certain they, about do their, they do their, it all yeah, year I don't know long. About their breeding. I don't know. But well, it, it was a very be. successful year last year for yeah. the lemon shark. <laughs> they did good. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did very well. Um, so that's that's interesting with the uh, with the different things that they eat. Um, so with all the different things that we've talked about, you know, finding the pharmaceuticals in the fish and and um, you know all the different tagging and and studies that you're doing on the on the fin clips what what happens from here um we know this is happening we know that it's in the fish but what what do we do from here yeah so as far as our research goes our, we have already completed step two or what our next step was you know step one was this bonefish study and this study is like the first of its kind in a marine environment it anywhere really um looking at a, a sport fish or like a large fish a lot of what we sample 
um, water, right? Or, you know, they, they use mussels as like a, a sentinel species all over the country for, it's like called Muscle Watch. They're looking at what's in the water. But what's really interesting, what we found, because we took water samples too, um, these contaminants are at concentrations that are so low in the water, we can't even detect them. Mm. But a fish that's breathing in that water is accumulating that to a concentration that we can detect it. So our most common, one of our most common drugs in a bone fish was an anti-anxiety drug. And we didn't find that in any water sample. And we didn't find that in any of our prey samples. So if we were to take a water sample and say, okay, we found X, Y, Z, this is what we need to be concerned about. That's not really the case. Because then we sampled the fish and realized X, Y, Z in water is not, well, what's in the bonefish wasn't even in the water. So the next step is to do more sampling of the higher level organisms that are accumulating these drugs that, or contaminants that don't really bioaccumulate or in really low concentrations in the water. So we get a better idea of what's out there. Hmm. And then it's kind of like expanding. So we did bonefish and we expanded in redfish and we did that in the entire state of Florida. So all over the state of Florida. And we found, so we did 113 redfish and this is from nine different estuaries. So for your listeners across the state, it was um, Apalachicola, uh, Pensacola, let's see, um, Cedar Key, Charlotte Harbor, Tampa Bay, Florida Bay, Indian River Lagoon, Jacksonville and St. Augustine. So we went all over the place and did the same thing looking at the pharmaceuticals. Uh, so out of the 113, they, were only five fish that didn't have any. That didn't have and, any. And did so those all come from the same place or where? No, those were from, those were a spattering from different areas. Yeah. Huh. Um, we found some surprising drugs. So in one of the more rural areas, uh, Apalachicola, we found every, all, I think it was every single fish or it was 14 out of 15 that had uh, tramadol, which is an opiate. So it's a pretty powerful opiate that you would be, likely administered at a hospital or prescribed um, with like severe pain. So it's another case of a rural area having a high concentration or prevalence of drugs, maybe just because of it not being treated correctly, the wastewater could be that sort of thing. So it, it's another study that showed us rural and urban, they can both be at risk and um, threatened by these sort of contaminants. So that was, let's say, step two is expanding it and seeing is it really all coastal species. Then next, it's we're working on it right now, looking at those health indices. And then you could zoom out and say what's happening with the behavior and do some tracking studies. But I guess that's those are the next steps when it comes to the fish and the fisheries. But then there's next steps when it comes to solving the problem, because, you know, at a certain point, we know enough. But we need to compile all this information so that we can solve the problem on the other end, which is wastewater treatment here. So now we're gathering evidence saying it's there, it's at concentrations that can do something. Now we're going to figure out what sort of effects they might be having. And then in the back end, it's really, you know, conversations like we're having and just in the in the public sector promoting better wastewater treatment so that we can protect our fisheries, protect ourselves. Because, you know, as we mentioned in the beginning, we're being exposed to mm -hmm. it's not just the fish. Um, and we, we don't know what happens over the course of your whole life. Right. So, right. you know, certain when, when people started smoking, it was cool and great for a number of years. And then they're like, I think it's doing something. So it could, that could be the case here. You know, some of these drugs have only been around for a couple of years and we don't know what happens when it's being exposed to us our whole life at a super small dose. It's one thing for you to uh, develop all these studies and mount all this evidence, but then it's another thing to present it to city planners or, or whoever and, and have them listen to you. Do you think that that's a challenge? Because, I mean, what you're presenting is, is an incredibly expensive overhaul on sewage systems or, or water treatment plants, which is probably not what anybody wants to hear. That money's probably already, you know, set aside for something else. And this is a massive, um, well, it could be a big problem, depending on how you look at it. It could be their opportunity to really clean up the city and clean up the, yeah. the, 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 the you know, that could be their that could be their their campaign that they take all the way to the presidency or something. I don't know. Or it could be, man, 
we don't want to spend money on that if we don't have to. And you're not even detecting this in the water. How do we even know? What, what if these bonefish got it some other way? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, do you think that that's a, a challenge one way or another, whatever the situation is, whether, you know, to, to, to mount a case that somebody, you know, that's basically undeniable and that people kind of have to pay attention to? Or is that a is that a, something that you would consider challenge in the future? That's definitely a challenge. And I mean, you mentioned, I think, one of the last comments there that these are fish that move. So it could be one municipality saying, well, um, we're the they, they could say that it's being exposed by the wastewater treatment plant and the other municipality. So then there's all that, you know, legislative red tape. But it, as a whole, I'd say the response that I've gotten and my impression has been really positive of every experience. Like we were invited to present this information a year ago in Tallahassee to legislators and they're listening and um, we're chatting about it now. We've been communicating with news outlets. Um, and what's probably one of the coolest things I've done so far with this research is we got to help out with um, some litigation in the city of Marathon and trying to better understand how their wastewater treatment um, affects the ecosystems there. Hmm. So. It's definitely being received well, but you you mentioned and you're pretty spot on about all the barriers that we have to it. So there is a cost and the cost up front is um, it can be sometimes expensive, but the operating um, in the ends in the long run can uh, really save some money too because like some of these new technologies they can reduce the biosolid waste and that's something that we deal with that's a I didn't know about this until I was communicating with um, a lawyer in, I can't remember which county in Florida, but one of the rural ones. So all of the wastewater, um, biosolid waste from Miami-Dade County, we truck out to another county and we pay landowners to spread it out on their property. Hmm. And I, I guess that's under the pretense that it's fertilizer, but I mean, it's it's not fertilizer. So there's these contaminants in that biosolid waste. So if we were to, um, and that can just be leached out into local water bodies, but if we were to have these newer technologies like it, the one I'm most referencing is um, ozonation. It can reduce the amount of biosolids. It's really effective at removing those PFAS and those other contaminants and pharmaceuticals. Um, but it's, it's a new technology. Um, but it is still being used elsewhere. It's just a matter of any time you're putting something new, it needs to be tweaked and um, tailored to every single wastewater treatment. So there's a barrier, but it's once this evidence, and I think we're getting there, becomes like insurmountable, there there needs to be action. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, at one point, I'm sure there wasn't any wastewater treatment and they're recognizing what's going on. And it, it, it's um, a progressive um, process that way. But I'd say the response has been great. And right. very makes me optimistic about the future. One one thing that uh, I forgot to ask you earlier is you were talking about one of the ways that you could get the pharmaceuticals out of the water was UV light, and mm -hmm. it seems like on a flat in the Florida Keys, that water is exposed to tremendous amounts of UV light. And is that not doing it? Does is that not enough to 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 kill it on its own? Like or to get Definitely rid of degrading it. Yes, yeah, degrading it, it I guess. But yeah, if, there's definitely. A constant, the UV... if there's a constant um, uh, influx of more, maybe that's maybe that's, that's the where thing. the problem constant is. Constant influx. And then um, let's say it goes in the sediment, then we've eliminated oh. sunlight. Yeah. So it could be in sediment. Uh, but we, we try to estimate, like, how long will these contaminants last in the lab? And so in the lab, we can use UV, we can put um, organic matter, temperature, and try to control all these environmental variables. And with that, we were like, okay, this one drug, it's half-life, so half of it will be gone in 12 days. And then continuing the experiment actually out in the environment, realized it was over 100 days. Mm. So these drugs, they're surprising, right? They don't behave the way you would expect them to. But yeah, sunlight can degrade it. It's just that constant supply that we keep coming back to as um, continuating the, this issue, making yeah. it persistent. Yeah. So how much, uh, how much time do you get to actually be sampling fish uh, rather than you know, writing reports on your computer? It's just I'm sure people are interested in that because yeah. it seems like such a cool opportunity. 
Well, at least at the beginning of my study, it was go, go, go fishing, sampling. Uh, it's not an easy task to get over 100 bonefish from areas in Biscayne Bay all the way through the dry tortugas and in Puerto Rico and in the Bahamas and in Belize and in Mexico. Because we've been chatting about Florida, but we um, did this throughout the Caribbean as well with bonefish. So at the beginning, it was rapid fire let's get all these fish so that took about one to two years to get it all done and then it's the toiling away on the computer but that's that's kind of where the magic happens to be honest because i mean we're figuring out what's going on there so it was a love hate for a long time for me when it comes to coding and doing all of that but once it, i got the hang of it in front of my eyes i'm like okay so now i understand what the the story is so it's a lot of out in the field. And this is kind of where the passion comes into it, that toiling away behind the computer. If you're passionate about these fisheries, it it makes it go down easier. So as a scientist, we spend a lot of time in the field, but then we go back to the lab and maybe you're processing samples or you're running analyses, you're writing up papers. But I think I can speak for everyone in our field. It feels meaningful when we're doing this because we know one way or the other, we're learning more about the fishery. We're helping anglers continue to sustainably fish for these fish for the foreseeable future. So it, it's kind of that in the background that keeps the, the gears turning. Yeah. Super, super interesting. I mean, I think that uh, you're doing good work and Thank I don't you. know what the result of the work is going to be. I hope people listen to you as it comes to uh, being a being a canary in the coal mine for potential problems and 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 addressing them before they're major problems. Um, yeah, but doing good work and and FIU lab is has been such a good friend to the podcast here and given us such good information um, so thanks for thanks for that and thanks for coming on and um, if people wanted to like follow your research or, or we mentioned we have one paper that's going to be in the in the show notes I don't know if you're going to supply anything else that could be in the show notes or if they want to follow you uh, individually or the FIU lab or just kind of give us give us everywhere that people can learn more yeah. about what we've talked about all, all of the above really um, to follow our lab I can give you the email for us, the website and our Instagram is FIU underscore fisheries underscore lab. And then myself is uh, Nick and two fish. Um, I was so you could follow that to see and stay up to date with our research and then follow Bonefish and Tarpon Trust to see um, that the research that they're doing, which is, is um, who funded a, all of our research as well to keep up to date with that. And as anglers in the Keys, there's ongoing projects that you can help out with. Like right now, there's a permit fin clip project. So if you're in the Keys and you're fishing for permit, you could stop by probably any fly shop down there. I know Florida Keys Outfitters has it, probably Seven Mile Fly Shop in Key West, probably the angling company, and pick up a little a little manila envelope to put a fin clip in to this is uh the stable isotope work to understand what their diet is so if you're an angler that's passionate about protecting these fisheries there's ways to get involved that the permit one and then yeah following us and reaching out to us you can learn about how to get involved so that redfish study we were only able to do that because of local anglers like None of us are from Apalachicola. I don't know the first thing about red fishing there, but reaching out, um, all of our samples were either local guides, local anglers that, that helped out. So th there's plenty of ways to get involved if you're concerned, passionate, or just think it's cool. Okay. And if you are getting involved in that, do you, do you have access to some of the data that is, that is uh, collected? Because I'm sure oh, as totally. fishermen, that's what, you're, that's what you're really the most interested in. If you caught this fish, could you learn a little bit more about where it has been or where it's going or, or you know, what it eats or I don't know, anything? Any kind that's of a super fun aspect. Yeah, the answer is, yeah, absolutely. If you get involved and you catch your redfish number 43A, whatever, we can tell you later what was in it um, or whatever it was we were looking at it. What was its health? What was it eating? So, yeah, if you get involved, you can be along for the ride through the whole process. Absolutely. That's super cool. I'm sure that many people will want to do that. Uh, Nick, thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. We learned a lot and uh, I'd love to have you on again. And we're going to try to get uh, you and Mike together on the boat. I think that'd be super that, fun. Yeah. 
that would be a blast for both of us and that that would be awesome no thanks again for having me it's great to have some ears listening to the research we're doing and bring it to life and make it feel super meaningful so it's awesome thank okay. you so much you're welcome you're welcome all right that's another awesome show we'll be back with another great guest just like nick next week so tune in for that 